you do? Would you call us out? Hell no. Good evening. Happy New Year. We'd like to welcome everyone here to our city council tonight, a regular meeting of the Shallow City Council by roll call. See that all council members are present with the exception of council, um, Councilman Leach. See what happens when you don't have a meeting for a month? You forget, <laughs> you forget everything. But now we'd like to welcome those of you who are with us tonight in the council chambers as well as anyone who may be watching at home on City 56. We'd like to begin this evening with an invocation. I will offer that followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Vice Mayor Hatch. Those who'd like to join with us, uh, please stand. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and grateful for the opportunity we have to meet as citizens and city officials and city staff. We're grateful for this new year and for the opportunities that it gives us and for the blessings of the past year that we've received. We're grateful for our citizens and for those who serve in our community and are so willing to do things and for the great area in which we live. Father, we're grateful for this country and for our freedoms and the liberties and for the armed forces that keep us safe and those men and women who have sacrificed the ultimate sacrifice in their families. We pray that they'll be comforted and we mourn with those that have mourned dearly for the loss of loved ones and the turmoil that we have throughout different parts of our country and nation. Heavenly Father, at this time, as much as we are in a serious condition here of dryness in our area. We petition thee for moisture as many citizens have turned their hearts to thee and we ask that thou might, if it be thy will, grant us with snow and moisture in this part of the area that we might be able to be blessed with it. We are grateful for all that thou has given to us and for our many blessings, our strength, and our sound minds and for the freedoms that we have to worship thee and to also to be part of this great country. May we ever be grateful for our forefathers, our ancestors, and those people who have given the most for us. And these things we ask for thy blessings now in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight, we'd like to begin a call to the public. Any citizen desiring to speak on a matter that's not uh, scheduled on the agenda may do so at this time. Know that your comments are limited to three minutes and need to be directed to the council as a whole. So that nobody move forward, we'll close call to the public and come back to the next item, which we have is a special events a presentation of our comprehensive annual financial report. Mr. Justin Johnson, as well as McKay Hall from St. George. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, thank you for the opportunity tonight to discuss the comprehensive annual financial report, otherwise known as the CAFR. And I would like to introduce McKay Hall. He's the senior audit manager from Hinton Burdick. And they've been doing our audit for quite some time. We did do a, a request for proposals in 2016 and Hinton Burdick was selected to do our audit for another five year term with a couple of extensions available. but. I'd like to turn the time over to McKay to discuss the CAFR with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here with you. I've got a fair number of slides uh, to touch on, information to go over, but I'm planning on going through them fairly quickly. I could probably go on and on about these things all night, but uh, I'm hoping to keep it to about 15 or 20 minutes. If, as I go through it, I seem to be going over something uh, that you have questions on, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'd be happy to address those questions at any point. So, as Justin said, I'm an audit manager with Hinton Burdick, and I've been with them for about 10 years now. Um, I am a certified public accountant, a certified fraud examiner, systems information uh, technology professional, and a certified information systems auditor. So uh, that's a little bit about me and my history. Um, this evening, I'm planning on touching on the results of the audit, touching on a few of the highlights related to the city's 
CAFR, and then going through and taking a quick look at some five-year trends in the major funds and some of the more common, more important numbers. So the audit reports, our duty as auditors is to come in to test the financial transactions, the financial records and information of the city, and to see if the information that's presented is reasonably and materially correct. Material being, if there's a piece of information that's incorrect, which would change the opinion of a user of the financial statements, that would be a material misstatement. And so we're looking to see if there are any material misstatements in that financial information, either through error or fraud. And we're happy to say that based on the test work which we performed, we found no material misstatements. So we issue a clean or an unqualified opinion stating that the information appears to be materially and reasonably correct. We also issue a report on the compliance uh, on internal controls over financial reporting. One of our primary, fo well, our primary focus is not the internal controls of the city. But in performing the financial audit, one of the steps that we have is to go through and take a look at what internal controls, what processes the city has in place to safeguard its assets. And if we see that there is a problem with those internal controls, then we issue material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. A material weakness being a weakness in a control or a group of controls, which would allow a material misstatement to be processed through without being caught and addressed in the normal course of operations of the city. Significant deficiency is similar, though less likely to be processed. We're happy to report that we did not find anything that was found to be a material weakness or a significant deficiency. So again, there, um, no findings with relation to those or a clean opinion with respect to those. There's also a state compliance report and we are issuing an unmodified or clean opinion there. There were no material reportable findings there. A few of the highlights. Total net position for the city, uh, which is basically the equity of the city, what's left after assets and liabilities are factored out, was $111,477,463 as of June 30th, 2017. That information is on page 19. It's where the government-wide statements are, um, or a summation of all the information up into two columns, which are governmental and proprietary funds. Yeah, you know, if I might, I don't know if I should go through the mirror or just let you recognize me, but uh, these letters that are in the front of the yes. audit, the audit is great to look at, if you like numbers, a lot anyway, but Am I correct if I head off on the assumption that these two documents right here in the front are kind of a summary, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth and you can change anything I say to correct it, please, but would be highlighted and noted in bold way if there were something seriously wrong with the way the city of Sholo was handling its finances. Is, is that a fair statement in general? Yes, in general, I believe that to be a reasonable statement, which is to say that as we go through and do our test work, if it appears that they're not accounting for things correctly, then we would issue findings and put them in those reports and those letters. Yes. And, or, and uh, obvious, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Um, or if, if there was insufficient information for us to be able to come to a conclusion, and we said, you know what, the information that's in the system, we just don't know if it's correct or not, then we would issue a qualified or a modified opinion in our audit report there on page one, two, and three of the... And we did not get that. You got an unqualified, okay. which is and to say it appears that the information is correct and accurate. With one item where more money was spent and budgeted or authorized, and that was on there, a utility bill. Yep. And I, I gotta wonder, I don't know if you should speculate on if we should call the utility company, if it should happen again and say, hey, you raised the rate, we didn't budget enough, we're just not paying this until next year and we'll catch you up. Or, <laughs> I can't imagine what we could do about that other than budget more next year, I guess. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Um, put in a contingency 
line item in your budget for unexpected expenses. That's what we would recommend. And that way you can amend, allocate that budget down and actually um, make sure that you have sufficient budget to cover the expense. That can be a bit of a challenge sometimes because you really don't have any control over what the utility company does. And so... I understand. I just look at that and I want to die. What are we going to do? Just not yeah. pay him? You know, I mean, I didn't think that'd go over real good. And it actually came pretty close. I mean, you budgeted yeah, 204000 and the expense was 208000 So it did go, technically it went over budget, but given the amounts of the budget, it's not really a large amount for the city. So, again, I'm asking for elaboration if you'd care to give it, but since you went to the trouble to point out such a minor overage, that we paid, and as far a item such as an electric bill mm. that was over because they raised the rates, that makes me believe anything that was more out of the way would definitely be reported here if you found it. Yes, if there were larger budget issues or if there were other compliance issues, or if there were weaknesses in the processes and the controls, we would we would know. And I yes. hope nobody here or the public took my comments to mean that I really feel like we have a major <clears throat> problem. I think we got something to do different next year, and I'll bet you it's already in the works <clears throat> to do it different. It is. As I've talked with, with the finance department, they are aware of the issue and have taken steps, are taking steps to make sure that it's addressed. Thank you. I think it's also worth noting that in prior years there have been more findings and the finance department has been taking steps, the city has been taking steps to address those as they've been noted and they have come down and there was the one compliance issue which noted uh, related to that small overage on the budget. So I think that speaks highly of the focus and dedication of your, your people to make sure that these issues are addressed. So, thank, thank you. you. That's a good question. On the net position, the total net position for the city was the 111 million. The reason that we would like to touch on net position and, and to review it is that over time, it's an indicator of the health of the city, which is to say that if your net position stays fairly steady or goes up over time, that's a healthy trend. If it goes down over time, that generally is an unhealthy trend. Some up and down year to year is not a bad thing, but it's worth watching over time to make sure that the city doesn't uh, use up its resources. Some other highlights, total net position increased last year by 1.1 million. Uh, that information, as I s believe I said, is on page 19 government-wide statements. It's worth noting that the governmental activities increased by 1.3 million and the business type activities had a decrease of 200,000, which net together to the overall increase of 1.1 million. There on pages 19 and 20, I believe, just real quick, if you're looking for the detail of that, this gives you the revenues and expenses for the city on the government-wide overall. Uh, this information shows the expenses, the charges for service, and the grand information. And the next page shows the general revenues, uh, which primarily is a governmental activity uh, set of information and revenues, but there is some for the business type activities there as well. If you look in the lower left-hand corner on this slide, you'll see that it gives your total of $111 million for your total net position for the city, which is the increase of the $1.1 from the prior year, 110 million. Some other highlights, governmental capital assets increased by 3.4 million. Uh, there were, overall, there were 8.9 million in additions and there was depreciation of 3.4 million. Now, that information is given in more detail on page 42. It gives a summary of the additions and the depreciation. Some of the significant capital asset additions that we noticed in the course of our test work, there was the public safety building for the 5.2 million, the Park Valley Road phase one for the 487,000, uh, the lower power lines for 513,000, and then street improvements for 890,000. 
the business type capital assets actually decreased overall by 861,000. There were additions of 12 million. Uh, that included 10.5 million of prior year expenditures that were recorded as construction in progress on projects that had not been completed in prior years. They were in fiscal year 17, and so they came down as part of that $12 million addition this year. And the business type activities had depreciation of 2.3 million. That information's on that next page over on page 43. Some of the significant additions that we noted, there was the wastewater treatment plant that was finished up for the 10.6 million. There were some sewer extensions and upgrades for 368,000. And then there was the 4th Avenue water line for 189,000. Liabilities, the total governmental liabilities increased by 607,000 for the year, uh, up to 29.2 million as of June 30th, 2017. That information is on page 44. I don't have a slide on here, but if you look in the CAFR on page 44, what you'll notice is that there were regularly scheduled debt service payments of 1.7 million. Um, and then next year there will be, there are scheduled payments of 1.6 million. So the reason that the long-term debt increased this year, even though the city made its regularly scheduled debt service payments, had to do with retirement and the net pension liability. Mm -hmm. With the Governmental Accounting Standards Board making that change a couple of years back so that each and every municipality has to record a portion of the state's retirement plan on their books, that's increased the liabilities of every city throughout the United States. And so the city's liability increased because of that retirement number, but that's not a number that the city really has a whole lot of control over. Depending on how the plan performs uh, and other factors that are beyond the city's control, that number is going to go up and go down. So it's worth keeping that in mind as you take a look at that number. It's not really a number that the city can say, you know what, we're going to pay off this liability today, write a check and send it in. It needs to be watched over time. Uh, it is a future liability that is calculated by an actuary and then is recognized. So there are some things that can be done to influence it, but it's not really one that you can just pay off. So it's worth keeping that in mind as you, as you take a look at that information. <laughs> The total business type long-term liabilities decreased by 583,000 down to 8.6 million as of June 30th, 2017. That information is also on page 44. There were regularly scheduled debt service payments of 721,000. And then the scheduled payments for fiscal year 18, this current fiscal year, uh, 550,000. The general fund is an important fund, and so we like to touch on some numbers there. The total fund balance for the general <coughs> fund increased from last year's balance of $7 million up to $8.2 million, with the fund balance being 70% of the general fund expenditures before transfers. Detail of that information is on page 22. The general fund reported revenues in excess of expenditures of $1.2 million, which included net transfers out and other financing sources. Uh, totaling the 2.7 million. Actual fund resources received in the general fund were more than were budgeted by 1.6 million, which was mainly due to city an increase in, in the city sales tax above and beyond what was anticipated and budgeted for. Actual expenditures were 1.6 million less than the final budget. And that budget to actual information is on page 72. This is a good trend. If your revenues are over budget and your expenditures are under budget, that gives you a chance to build the resources to be able to meet unexpected activities. Because every once in a while, you'll have some years where it goes the other way around. So if you can do this on more often, then you should be in good circumstances. So of uh, the situations to have, that is a good one right there. Regarding the HERF fund, there were no changes in the HERF fund balance. It remained $1.4 million, uh, which was last year's fund balance. And again, the end of this year, that was its ending fund balance. On the proprietary funds, the enterprise funds, uh, each, they all had, well, except for the wastewater fund, had operating income. 
for the utility funds, for the business type funds, it's important that they have a net income. They need to operate in such a way to have a net income, not a net loss, because they're going to have infrastructure and things that have to be replaced, and they need to build up the resources over time. So having that situation with your enterprise funds where they have that operating income, that's a good situation in which to be. And when you end up with situations like the wastewater fund, where it didn't have one this year, it's worth keeping an eye on that and taking, making changes, taking steps to address it if it's a persistent situation. As I've talked with the finance department, it's a situation that they're aware of with the wastewater fund and they are reviewing, taking steps to address that issue. Cash flow is another important item for the enterprise funds because as a full cruel accounting for the enterprise funds, it is possible to end up in a situation where they have income, but they don't get any cash. And just like a normal business, an enterprise fund can become cash starved and find itself in, in pretty dire straits uh, if it's not careful. But each of your utility funds have positive cash flow for the year, so that's a good situation. Uh, as we said, the overall change in net assets for the year was a decrease of 211000 Some of the five-year trends, like I said, I don't plan on spending a whole lot of time going through each slide, but once again, if you have any questions as we look at these, please feel free to let me know. The general fund, the, you've got your assets, liabilities, and fund balance there. As you can see, the Liabilities have remained fairly low. This year they've increased through some prepaid items and normal operations. So there was a bit of an increase, but we anticipate that over the upcoming years that will decrease. Um, as you take a look, you can also see that top line is the assets. The second line down is the fund balance or net position of the general fund. And that fund balance is an indication of what resources the city has to meet its needs as they come up. So you like to keep that one uh, following your asset trend, and so you're in a good situation there. General fund cash trend, as you can see, cash has been increasing over the last five years. Uh, then there's restricted cash. It's also increased this year, once again, in relation to some of the normal operations and prepaid items. Revenues and expenditures. Over time, the general fund is expected to break even. Its purpose is not to make money. But you do want to make sure that over time, you're able to build up a resource pool, as we talked about, the net position in order to meet the needs of the city as they come up. So to see some years where your assets, <coughs> excuse me, your revenues are more than your expenditures is not a problem because there will be years at some point in time when it'll be the other way around. Real quick summary on the expenditures in the general fund last year compared to this year. The general government, uh, the expenditures have increased by about 310,000. The public safety, they've increased by the 361,000. The other funds have remained, or excuse me, the other departments in the general fund remain reasonably consistent. Non-departmental expenses have been brought down this year, so. All in all, there was an increase of 473000 which was due primarily to um, wage and benefits and capital expenditures for the year. Sales tax revenue, as we said, sales tax revenue was more than the final budget. Looking at the five years, we can see that it's increased uh, over the last five years, and so that's a good trend. 19% overall over the last five years, 2.9% increase from last year. The other sale, excuse me, the other tax revenues shown right there, they've had some small increases as well. The state sales taxes have actually come down just a little bit this year, but they're reasonably consistent with last year. The other taxes have increased some over, uh, from last year, and there's been a steady increase overall for the last five years. Total tax revenue, just summing them up and showing that trend over the five years, and they've increased as we were seeing. This gives you a quick look at the percentage change in tax revenue over the last five years. Uh, 
So five, for example, in 2013, there was the 5.87% increase in sales tax and the 6.84% increase in total taxes from fiscal year 2012. So as you can see, there were some sizable increases in 13, 14, and 15. Uh, while those amounts, the size of the increase has gone down in 16 and 17, there's still been an increase both of those years. The HER fund, revenues and expenses, as you can see, the total revenues for the fund have been less than the total expenses for the last five years. Um, there have been transfers made by the city from other funds in to cover those expenses for projects that have been occurring in that fund. Cash for the last five years, if you take a look, it's been fairly steady for the last five years. And that's because the revenues coming in and the expenditures going out have been fairly consistent over the last five years, and so there hasn't been a lot of change in the assets or the cash. The airport fund has remained reasonably consistent. As a governmental fund, once again, its purpose is not to earn money, and so this trend is not uh, unusual. It's to be expected. Over time, the revenues and the expenses should equal out, and each year they've been pretty close to each other. The water enterprise fund, as I said, as a business type, this one does need to build up its resources. It should turn a profit in its operations, as it were. And if we take a look at the last five years, that top line is the total revenues. The bottom line is the total expenses. As you can see, it has been bringing in a profit. There has been more revenue coming in than expenses going out. As I said, that's important because those resources need to be built up in there. Uh, infrastructure, I have never seen infrastructure replacement, maintenance, repairs go down in cost. It's only ever gone up in cost. So you've got to make sure you have the resources to replace the infrastructure as needed. And the cash has increased over the last five years in the water fund. Once again, those resources need to be reserved. And so a buildup of cash fund in order to meet those needs is expected and reasonable. <coughs> the wastewater fund as a proprietary fund. It needs to have a bit of a net profit. As you can see, it's been running pretty thin margins over the last couple of years. There have been a number of years where the expenses have been more than the revenues coming in. Uh, as I said, that is a situation that the departments are aware of and taking a look at. The cash for the wastewater fund, there was a decrease in 2016, a pretty sizable decrease related to the wastewater treatment plant project. And so that decrease was expected and, and is reasonable. The internal service health insurance fund as you take a look, three of the last five years, the expenses have been less than the revenues. Two of the five, uh, the expenses were slightly more than the revenues. Um, that is not an unusual trend. Once again, over time, it's not really supposed to make money, but health care costs are always going up, and so to build up some reserves there is reasonable. The cash trend follows suit with that prior slide we were just looking at. As the revenues have exceeded the expenditures, there's been a bit of a cash buildup in that fund, which again appears reasonable. This gives a quick look at the governmental funds. Uh, fund balance. It uh, gives you the red, which is last year's, and the blue, <coughs> which is this year's. As you can see, the general fund has had some increase. HERF has remained fairly consistent. The other funds have been fairly consistent except for the special projects, but that's because there were some special projects completed in 17, which drew down those resources there. So that was expected and is reasonable. For the major proprietary funds, as you can see, there's a little bit of change in those, but not a whole lot. The wastewater came down slightly this year, water went up a little bit this year. That gives a quick uh, look at the dollar figures in each one of those funds. And then we're to the questions. If there are any questions that have not yet been asked. No questions? Does the public have any questions? No, I appreciate you coming and sharing that. Uh, Jean, Councilmember Kelly. I kind of already asked it, but I'm going to ask it in a different way. 
If, if, if it's a legal question, if it's not, you'd have to tell me. If you had one of these seats up mm -hmm. here, knowing everything you know about the finances of Sholo, would there be something you'd really be looking at in this not upcoming budget session other than maybe seeing to it we budget enough for utility costs? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> I hope so. And, and this may or may not sound like a dodge, but it's, it's hard for me to answer that just because there are so many factors that, that will form a person's decision on that. As far as the information goes, I think that the information that your finance department is giving you based on our test work looks like it's correct. And so if I were in that seat, I would, I would feel comfortable relying on the information that they give you to make that decision one way or the other. Okay, because I didn't intend to give you any wiggle room there. You'd have to say, yeah, there's a certain department that I really would have to look at if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And you didn't say that. I am not aware of any. Once again, it's based on our test work. Mm -hmm. When we come in to do the audit, we don't take a look at every single transaction. I understand that. So if I seem hesitant, that's, that's why. Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to tell you you know, there's absolutely no question about every single transaction because as we did our audit, we haven't taken a look at every single transaction. Based on the test work we've done and what I've looked at, there's nothing that comes to mind that I think, you know, you really need to just break out the shovel and dig and dig and dig until there's no tomorrow because what we've seen appears to be accurate and appears to be correct based on what we've done. In our test work, We've looked at the supporting documentation. We've gone out and we've confirmed some amounts with outside parties. So does that answer your question? Well, pretty much. And let me go ahead and tag on to it and say, with your expertise in this field, hmm. if somebody was doing something, you would know basically the methodologies people use to do something wrong or crooked. That don't mean you'd catch them every time. Long term, it'd show up. Mm. Is that a fair statement? And the way I gave you what I considered no wiggle room, the way you answered it makes me think, okay, we're starting into the next budget study sessions and let's just get into them and get going. Mm. Because I don't have to be worried about the way we're doing business. Is that fair? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Meant to be. Yes, I do know a number of ways that people go about doing things they're not supposed to do. And you didn't see any of those is what I'm getting at. I did not see any of those. That is correct. The important part is, though, because we come in, we test a few things. The really important part is your internal controls, your processes, to make sure that those are solid and, and that there is as little chance for error or fraud to occur as can be. Now, based on what we've seen, it looks like you've got a good set of controls in place, but that is always something that your city manager and your finance department needs to be taking a look at to make sure that they are also comfortable with the way that it works. Oh, yeah. And from what I've seen, that appears to be something that they are doing. Thank you. Council Member Critton. I think the exciting thing about this is this same type of question has been asked for a lot of, lot of years. <clears throat> and so far, there have been no indications that major changes need to be made, that we are attempting to follow the guidelines of our auditors, of our finance department and everything. And everything I've seen since I've been on city council is that our management is attempting to do whatever it can to do things the right way, mm -hmm. which I think is great. That's all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments? I would just tag on. You're not done yet, Gene. If anybody <laughs> read into any of my questions that I really think there's something wrong, you're mistaken. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to back up what he was saying because I knew what he was saying. I just said it a different way. 
And, 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 as I, and I think, you know, <coughs> one of the things that may have any concern whatsoever, we've gone through four second. finance managers, not that any one of those managers needed to be changed, okay? But yet uh, it shows, I believe, that we have some good measures in place and those measures have followed through. And in a lot of instances, we have got better. Mm. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. It's important to have a good team in place right. and that it's not dependent upon one particular individual, but a group of people who work together. And that, that does appear to be the situation the city has had for a number of years. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right, we'll let you go. Okay. Appreciate it. Enjoy Thank you your very much. drive back if you're headed back tonight. In a far away. Um, as I said last year, I apologize. If there are any questions, if you have any come up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're always um, welcome to get in touch with me. Uh, that we'll ask Gene, he'll have his kaffir next to his bed. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate Gene and, and Rennie and their thoroughness of going through that. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next item we have is on the consent calendar. Uh, <coughs> look for council if there's any items that need to be polled or discussed separately. Okay, the items that we have is consideration of acceptance of a grant from Association for the Library Services to Children and authorize the associated budget transfers. <coughs> we have a consideration of authorization to, to purchase uh, police vehicles consideration of approval of a non-commercial hangar lease. We have also the consideration of approval to make purchases from National Intergovernmental Purchasing Alliance, and then the minutes of the December 5th, 2017 meeting. So moved. Uh, we have a motion to approve the consent calendar by Council Member Balsop, seconded by Council Member Crittenden. Any other discussion? Call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? See that, that passed six to zero. Thank you. The next item we have is a new business consideration of ordinance number 2018-01, adding article 18-5, smile wireless facilities to chapter 18. Mr. Tregaskis. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, before I get into the actual staff report, I do have a presentation that I'm going to go through, uh, provide some background information as to why we're here uh, and why we're having this discussion. So we'll go through that. Hopefully that may answer some questions uh, prior to the question actually being asked. Uh, I will then go through the background, at which time I'll be available for questions. So. Um, as the council will recall, at their retreat of October 5th, uh, we went through a number of issues uh, related to legislative amendments and changes. One of those was related to what's called a small cell wireless tower. Um, they're also re referred to as an SWF or a small wireless facility. Uh, you can see here what are small cell deployments. This is kind of a new technology. A lot of people were not familiar with this. Um, you can see that uh, these are facilities that are mounted on existing types of poles, street lights, utility poles, uh, or new poles that are installed. Uh, the purpose of those is to provide coverage in a limited area or in a high traffic area. So uh, Times Square, for example, might be a place where you might see some of these because of the amount of traffic that you see. Um, the equipment that is used uh, can be quite varied uh, and uh, can, can really stick out. You can see this is a slide that shows uh, the different types of equipment when it is mounted to a street light. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different uh, items that are located on this street light, each one having to do with these small wireless facilities. Uh, you can see here's another installation uh, just mounted on the side of an existing wood uh, street light pole. Uh, you can see this one also um, mounted on a street light. And then you can see like this, this is where they've taken that equipment and they've constructed a shroud around that so that it's kind of shielded. Uh, you don't see all the ins and outs of the equipment. Uh, you can see this one here, that's another type of installation where the actual antenna is mounted on top of the pole with the equipment itself mounted about midway on the pole. You'll also notice on the ground that there's a fire hydrant 
but really no shelter uh, that would go along with any other type of equipment. Uh, that's because that equipment is mounted underground rather than above the ground. So last year, uh, February, our legislature and governor passed what's called House Bill 2365, which is wireless facilities and the rights of way. That allows wireless providers to install and operate small wireless facilities and related equipment in rights of way. Uh, there's an effective date of February 9th of this year <clears throat> or three months after receiving the first request by wireless provider, whichever is later. At this time, we have not received any requests from a, a, a wireless provider. So we're a little bit ahead of the game, which is where we like to be rather than uh, behind in doing this. The uh, state law defines the allowable size of a small wireless facility. Uh, that definition is six cubic feet. So one foot by one foot by six foot is what they can put on these poles or any combination of numbers that comes up to that same uh, six. What's interesting is the state law specifically states that they are not subject to zoning review unless they exceed the heights that are provided. So if they don't go higher than 50 feet or 10 feet above an existing pole, they are not subject to zoning review and they're permitted under the state law. Cities are permitted to require reasonable appearance and concealment requirements and setback or fall zone requirements. Again, that's why we're here this evening. Uh, you can see the definition, six cubic feet of antennas, 28 cubic feet of wireless equipment, and then they can do 50 cubic feet of wireless equipment only if it was ground mounted prior to August 9th of 2017. We do not have any that uh, fall under that category. So we're looking at the first two bullet points uh, here. Uh, standards, not subject to zoning review. Uh, if there is no pole within 500 feet, they cannot exceed 40 feet above ground level. Uh, and co-locations are also not subject to zoning review if they meet the above standards. <clears throat> so here's the maze. The city of Sholo may adopt provisions that concern public safety. We may adopt objective design standards. We may adopt reasonable stealth and concealment requirements. We may adopt undergrounding requirements. We may adopt design standards for utility poles, and we may adopt reasonable spacing requirements. What you have before you this evening uh, does have provisions for public safety, things like setbacks from driveways, uh, things like setbacks from other existing utilities. Uh, those types of things are addressed in here. Uh, we did adopt uh, objective design standards. We want uh, the equipment to be shrouded like you saw in some of those pictures. Uh, we also want the light poles to be approved by city staff as something that would, uh, if it doesn't necessarily match 100%, it at least is consistent with, uh, so that it wouldn't really stick out. Uh, reasonable stealth and concealment requirements, we're recommending that rather than ground mounting and having the equipment visible, uh, that it be underground mounted uh, so that it does not stick up. That ties in a little bit with the public safety as well, as this is in the right of way. Um, we are adopting design standards for utility poles. Again, that goes up to the bullet point number two. Uh, at this point, we are not recommending spacing requirements. However, that is something that we may bring back to the council in the future. Um, there may be locations where it would be beneficial to allow perhaps more than one of these uh, within a certain distance rather than requiring them to be a minimum distance apart. And so rather than adopt a minimum, um, we're kind of recommending that we take a wait and see approach on that to see if that truly plays out uh, or if we need to look at making sure that they're a minimum distance apart. Uh, fees, the state statute included specific fees they may be charged if tied directly to the direct and actual cost of managing the right of way. Uh, you'll see in the fees that we are recommending a $200 a year uh, fee. That is for the cost for managing the right of way. It's anticipated we'll spend approximately four hours per year per location of city staff time. Uh, that would include vehicles, that would include staff time. 
uh, going out and inspecting, you know, have there been any impacts on drainage? Are we seeing erosion? Do the, we need to take care of weeds or things around there? Um, so we see that with that fee. Uh, we can only charge them if other right-of-way users are charged right-of-way use fees, and we cannot exceed fees included in the statute. So what are those fees? Here you go. Um, these are the fees that are set by statute. Staff is recommending that we adopt these fees as included in the statute uh, with one clarification. That would be the right-of-way use fee, uh, limited to not more than the direct and actual cost of managing the right-of-way. Uh, we are establishing that at $200 per year for reasons stated previously. Uh, we also are uh, changing one of these fees in an effort to uh, encourage people to locate on existing poles and not just put new poles in our right-of-way. Uh, so the right-of-way use fee for monopoles and associated wireless facilities um, that is normally would be $200 a year times the number of small wireless facilities. So if you had five, you're looking at a thousand a year. We are proposing that that be waived for locations on pre-existing utility and light poles. Um, all other fees would stay the same as set by statute. Uh, with that, I will go through the uh, staff summary. At the October 5th, 2017 Council Retreat, staff presented information related to recent changes in state law on small wireless facilities. As passed by the state legislature, cities must allow placing small wireless facilities in city rights of way. Uh, we do not have the option to tell them no. Although these facilities are exempt from zoning regulations, cities may adopt fees and provisions that concern public safety, objective to design standards, reasonable stealth and concealment requirements, undergrounding requirements, design standards for utility poles, and reasonable spacing requirements in accordance with state statutes. City staff reviewed what other cities and towns have enacted and subsequently drafted a design standards, concepts, and requirements for wireless facilities in the right-of-way. This document is based largely off of other cities' models with modifications made to address Sholo's issues. Staff believes this document presents the clearest and most concise set of requirements of those researched. Also included in the document are fees related to the administration and review of wireless facilities and are tied directly to the fees allowed by state statute and the actual costs of managing the right-of-way. Ordinance number 2018-01 would amend chapter 18, streets and sidewalks of the city code to address installing small wireless facilities in the right-of-way. The applicable fees and installation standards would be referenced in Chapter 18 and would be adopted through Resolution R-2018-01. With that, uh, staff is available for questions. <coughs> Council Member Crittenden. Give me an example of who would be doing this. Uh, there's several different examples that have been given. Uh, the one that's probably most appropriate for the Sholo area and the topography that we have here. I think everybody who's used a cell phone realizes that there's spots in town that we get better coverage than perhaps others. Uh, you may see some of these wireless providers coming in and utilizing these types of facilities uh, to fill in some of those gaps um, in the coverage areas. Uh, that's really what they're intended to do. Councilmember Kelly. Yeah. It seems totally obvious. We're making rules that apply to poles that are owned by other entities. That's true, right? Uh, the poles, there's a number of them that are owned by other entities. There's a number of them that are owned by the city. So, yes. They apply to both. Yes. And the APS or whoever has no say in it. Uh, the entities that own the poles, um, APS would be able to say, you're not putting one of these on my pole. Um, APS would also be able to say, we don't mind you putting one on our pole. However, uh, that pole is not engineered for those facilities. You will have to replace it with a new pole. Um, so there is that ability for them. There really is not that ability for the city. So if that fee were very excessive, the obvious alternative, if I'm representing the one that wishes to put up this, 
antenna, is it fair to call it that? I don't know what it, what you call it, but anyway, equipment. Mm -hmm. I just set a new pole. And then the city would have some control about where I could set it, obviously. I can't drill through existing undergrounds to, to set that new pole up. But once they did set it up, it would be subject to the $200 a year fee. Plus the other fees that are in place, yes. And then if they went with a pole that was already theirs, ours or another entity, there is no fee if I understood your summary. The $200 a year, we are proposing that that be waived again in an attempt to encourage them to locate on existing poles rather than installing new poles. Okay. Thank you. And I, I read, read over this and I thought, <clears throat> you guys didn't have to invent the wheel here. You had some other things you could, you could play cheat sheet on it. Uh, and yes. Uh, and fortunately, read it and see if it looked like it fit us. And I'm yeah. glad that you, you didn't have to create. We used uh, Chandler's ordinance as our basis, but there was some considerable time and, and energy spent in modifying that to meet our requirements here. So we didn't start from scratch. Council member also. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to state, you know, October 5th, I wasn't at there. I was at the retreat thing, but I left before this came on. So I probably have some extra questions I need to ask since I wasn't there. Uh, <coughs> I understand where you're coming from. Um, there's a lot of this stuff here is definitely familiar with what I do. But uh, just get with what Councilman uh, Kelly just got done saying. If APS or Navapache have a pole line going down through city of Sholo, somebody can't just come in and set in a pole in between their power grid to put it up to try to interact with their power grid or make complications with their power grid. They have to go through, that would have to be something through their system to go through to put another power pole in there. Is that correct? Right. Um, there, there are several steps that would be in place. If they were putting a new pole, one that did not exist the day before, um, they would have to come through the city process um, with all the fees and all the review and that sort of thing. As part of that, we notify the affected utility companies to, to give them an opportunity to say, yeah, this is a problem or no, we really, we're not worried about it. If it is indeed a problem, then based on these, they would not be able to put that pole in that location. They would have to find something else. So, uh, I, sorry, Mayor, I have about seven or eight questions. Um, the other question I have, if it's a joint use pole, uh, Navapache, APS or, or whatever, uh, and it's a joint use pole and they wanna put the stuff on there and like you said, the pole was too small to hold their, now they would have to definitely go through APS or Navapache to get the okay to get that pole up. And then we recur a fee to going through us and then going through, they would have to pay Navapache or whatever to get that pole changed out and get up to, to the standards that they need to have that correct. That is correct. It, it would be similar to uh, if I owned a, a building and I had a tenant that wanted to come in and make some modifications to that building. The building is not owned by the city, but we would still require a, a building permit and inspections and things like that for those improvements. So it would be similar in this case where if it was a pole that wasn't owned by the city, there's still some city reviews and things that would take place. So you would still be paying some fees and, and uh, getting permits and that sort of thing going through our review process. Okay, the next question I have is down Main Street, we have light poles that are like four by fours. They're, they're metal four by four. Uh, if they want to come and attach to ours, we can do a joint use agreement with them in a right away for joint use. And now do we charge them from the bottom of the ground to the top of their equipment? Is that's why we charge them the, the square footage of that pole or, and if not, how are we gonna, you know, I, I see the fees of $50, is that per month, per year added on? But my next question added on to that, Justin, where you can, I know you can answer more than one at a time. If we have a four by four pole with our light on it and they, we deem it too small for their equipment and they need to change it out, that's our equipment, that's our pole. And they say, well, we need to go to an eight by eight to handle all this weight. 
now I got a four by four, a four by four, an eight by eight, four by four, maybe an eight by eight. And so now my downtown is looking different that we just spent 500 some odd thousand dollars on putting everything underground and put everything up. Now things have changed. So who's, are we gonna be able, are we gonna allow them to change our pole, every other pole to a different size pole? Or if they're gonna change one out, we change them all out. Um, in, first of all, I'd like to offer a clarification. Um, with the state law, the legislature exempted out any state right of ways. So any state highways, this would not fall under. Okay. Um, so when we talk like the downtown area, down the Deuce of Clubs, that's a state highway, that would, these would not be allowed in that state Good. highway. Okay. Um, so I think that's a valid clarification brought on by your question. A 90% so of first the question. <laughs> um, the other downtown areas that we have um, we are going to have to address our, uh, our zoning ordinance that deals with uh, cell towers. Because currently in our downtown area, we do not allow cell towers or cell facilities. This state law says we have to allow them in our right of way. Uh, from a staff level, we feel that it might be beneficial at this point based on this change that we uh, change our code a little bit so that we can give people options. So that rather than coming down right in front of City Hall and saying, I wanna put one of these in your right of way, we can say, you know what, we've got a City Hall that's got a really tall roof. Maybe we can work with you to get some, some antennas on that rather than putting a new pole up. That may be less disruptive and, and that sort of thing. So as part of this, you will see some changes coming recommended by staff and, and through the Planning and Zoning Commission to hopefully address some of those. In response to your question, if somebody wants to come in and replace one pole and not the next one, um, there's really not a whole lot we can say about that. What we can say is we're going to look at the pole that you are replacing and we are going to make sure as close as possible that it be compatible with the next pole that's down the road. So if, if the next pole down the road is a four by four and you, you got to put in an eight by eight because that's what the engineering says and our city engineers verified that, then we at least want it to be the same color and the same types of shape so that perhaps it doesn't just jump out at you that wow, that pole is way bigger and way different than the next one up the road. So we, we do have that provision in there to help address that concern. So the joint use part of it from the ground, we're just gonna bill them $50 a month or $50 a year for, for the use of our pole to put their stuff on, or is that per month, or how's that gonna be laid out? So um, let me see if I can go back here to the fee schedule that's given to us by the state. You can see here we have uh, a right-of-way use fee. That's $50 a year times the number of small wireless facilities. So company A comes and says, we want to put 10 of these in your right-of-way, 50 times 10, they write us a check, $500 once a year. Okay. The right-of-way use fee, that's the one that we have determined is $200 a year. They would write us a check, $200 times the number of poles that they have in place. So if they have 10 poles, you've got $50 times 10, now you have $200 times okay. 10. And then the authority utility pole attachment is $50 a year. That's basically the rental fee that we can charge for them to be on our pole. Um, the other fees are application fees that they pay up front. They don't necessarily pay those every year. Um, so basically those those top three fees are the ones that we would be looking at here at the city per poll. And then my last question, Mayor. Um, so then do we consider a telephone pole uh, with that equipment up there? Like where, I, where I'm at, the telephone pole is divided in four ways. So I got a back right, left, front right, left. And we pay a joint use percentage of that of whatever we use on the front or we use on the back for the height and everything else. Mm -hmm. Now theirs is no matter if it's one sided, all sides, completely rounded, it's still one fee. It's not multiple fees. 
Right, so going back to some of those examples um, that we saw on, on how they were, uh, how other cities, you, you've seen them, mm -hmm. some of them were round, you know, and, and they were just a round cylinder. That fee would be as you see here. The, some of them are flat and they locate them flat just on the side of the pole. That pole would pay these fees or that antenna, if you want to use that word, would pay these fees. If that pole was able to support, say, three, uh, one, each one of those antennas would pay these fees. Okay. So there is the possibility that you may see multiple antennas per pole, um, or you may just see one. Right. Again, it, it's it's kind of this is new. It's up in the air for us. So <coughs> as long as it's open, that we can maybe charge. Hopefully, if they start putting a whole bunch up there, we can start charging per unit or something like that. Yeah, it, it's per antenna on the pole. So yes, you could. Thank you for your time, Justin. Councilor Thomas. <coughs> On the design standards, it talks about the doghouse. You showed examples of those. Can we restrict? So those? the the doghouse itself, um, and myself and Mr. Brown had this conversation. Um, in looking at the terminology and the definitions that are used, you have your pole up at the here. You've got your antenna on top of that. Uh, we require that all of the wiring and things be uh, covered. So you may run it, if it's a hollow pole, you could run it down the center of the pole. If it's a solid pole, you run it down the side in some type of a conduit. When we refer to the doghouse, what we're actually referring to is basically that angled piece of metal that goes from the pole to the ground. It helps to get that, that equipment, the wiring, all of that swept down underneath the ground. So that's what we refer to when we're using the term doghouse. Um, what, we're, what we're really concerned about, and uh, I'm gonna go, I think, here, when we talk about the uh, small wireless facilities definitions, the one that people get most excited about is what's gonna actually be on the pole. How big is that gonna be? And that is defined by state statute as a maximum of six cubic feet. So one foot, one foot, six foot, again, however, what number those work. Where you get into the, the concern is the 28 cubic feet of wireless equipment. And that is what we're requiring them to place underground. We do have to, in, in our uh, ordinance, we have to give people, if there is just absolutely no way to place it underground, then at the determination of the public works director, they can come up with some other option. Uh, we have to kind of put that in there just from a legal standpoint, but our intent would be that you place all of your equipment underground. You might see an uh, electric pedestal sticking up. Electric companies don't like their meters underneath the ground. But as far as all of this other equipment that they use, uh, we're requiring that absent some extremely valid reason, uh, you won't see that. It'll be in a box that is underground. Okay, then the other question I have is, um, it talks about the right of way and it defines the right of way on page two. Um, and it has the exemptions. For instance, uh, federal, interstate highways, state highways, or state route um, under the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. It does talk about special taxing districts. Do, would that include our street lighting special tax district? Um, I think it would when you use the word property that is owned by a special taxing district. I, my understanding is our street lights would fall under that criteria. So we would have the choice as to allow it or not. Yes. Uh -huh. Council Member Kelly. Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Did I understand back when you said each of these will require its own power source? They'll have to have a meter at each one of these? Basically, yes. I mean, they are pow electrically powered. They will need some source of electricity as part of just the daily operations. And do you know if the state legislature, in all their wisdom that they have, 
gave any thought to subdivisions who have gone to great expense to have all underground utilities without poles, but there can be one right there, right? Right. So <laughs> I, I don't want to interpret what the state legislature did or didn't intend to do with I mean, this. there's no exemptions for that. No, but we can, they can have the option to place these antennas on an existing utility pole. So uh, we have a number of subdivisions that do not allow, um, and by city code, we do not allow overhead utilities in these subdivisions. Um, that would not preclude them from placing one of these antennas on a street light or on a pole in the right of way. However, we can still require that all utilities be underground to that facility. So you would not see overhead power running through a subdivision that otherwise would not have overhead electric. If we happen to exempt the subdivision from street lights, and there are no poles. <laughs> they would still be, by city code, they would still be required to run the electricity underground. For these, so. I know, but they could put up a, they could put up a, they can set up a pole. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, there's some high ground in this town that that could be to, real. To paint the worst case scenario, um, it would be possible under this state statute for somebody to place a 40-inch diameter pole, which is basically the size of a hula hoop, that is 50 feet tall that would be allowed in the right of way per this state statute. So what we are trying to do again is to encourage them to look at other options. Um, you know, what, what we're finding is that with these small wireless facilities, they're not really designed to cover a large area. We have uh, an existing tree, mono tree, pine tree at well number five um, that is designed to cover an extremely large area. These are designed to cover small areas where there are gaps in coverage. You normally don't have that on top of a hill. Usually that's more in the low-lying areas. Yeah. Our hope, and uh, you know how hopes and dreams are, but uh, our hope is that we will see these on a limited basis in these more low-lying areas to fill in those gaps rather than an attempt to provide uh, large areas of coverage. Thank you. In some of the meetings that I have attended on this, the, the hope is that these wireless companies can just come in and they can upgrade to 4G or 5G very quickly. They can just go through because the groundwork is done for them and they can add these. And then as more and more people you know, Google and different companies come in, they can track you more closely to your exact location of where you're at because now all of a sudden your data is being, you know, given back to them in several locations. Yeah, there, there are a number of justifications that were provided, I think is why the legislature um, looked at this. Self-driving vehicles are something that people are starting to look at. Uh, they need to have a, they need to have a check-in point every so often. This is one way to provide that. I don't know that they looked so heavily at rural areas such as us. I think they looked, again, primarily in larger cities where uh, you could have large crowds and you don't have coverage because there's just such a demand. Um, or you drive a block and perhaps there's a tall building that's blocking where you're at. I, I do think that was the primary reason. Um, we just get to deal with it uh, here in Sholo as well. So. Any other questions, comments? I Council think Member my Kelly? last question, okay. I think. <laughs> Could, would it be legal for them to contact a homeowner and put a device, you mentioned on the city hall, could they put a device on somebody's home? Uh, that is something that we would have to look at as part of our zoning code review. Right now, we do not allow these in a residentially zoned area. So it, it may behoove us to kind of loosen the reins a little bit and maybe allow a little bit more flexibility in some of these placements. In 
response to not wanting them right along the roadway. So those are some things we'll be discussing and, and we'll be bringing back to the council as some changes to that, that code. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, one last question. Yeah. Okay, so the antenna cannot be placed any higher than 50 foot, you said? Correct. Okay, so like the downtown says motel, downtown that's higher than 50 foot for them to put an antenna up there. <clears throat> so again, we're talking kind of two different things. Um, the, the state statute and what we've got tonight is in response to antennas in the right of way. City code uh, deals with antennas that are located on private property. So that's a little bit of a disconnect that we need to do with our zoning code so that we can address these. As part of that, we will be looking at our downtown commercial and perhaps even you know residential properties. Um, again, the, uh, the the downtown motel with the really tall sign. You know, if somebody did a nice job of putting a panel on there, kind of like what the hospital's done. Um, that may be beneficial to everybody, as opposed to placing a brand new tower, you know, in a downtown area or, or other areas that are, you know, similar. To, so, thank you for your information. Appreciate it. Any other comments? I'll ask uh, City Clerk by unanimous consent to read Ordinance Number Two Zero Eighteen Dash Show One by title only. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mayor. An ordinance of the Mayor and Council of the City of Shiloh, Arizona, adding Article 18.5, small wireless facilities to Chapter 18 streets and sidewalks of the Shiloh City Code. This time I'll look for a motion. Councilmember Crittenden. I move to adopt ordinance number 2018-01. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I'll second it. Second by Council Member also. Any other discussion? Yes, Mayor. I, you know, I just I know this is going to be a nightmare to keep uh, records on and everything else. It's just another thing that we're adding to staff to do that. And I, you know, I know it's going to be a time-consuming thing, especially when if you don't know exactly what day for a year and everything else to make those things. So I know it's, that it's going to be uh, just some added, added extra stuff here that we shouldn't have to be doing, but it's part of life, I guess. Thank you. Any other comment? I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? See that pass six to zero. <clears throat> Next to being back, a uh, motion to adopt resolution R20-1801. Look to council for a motion. So Councilwoman Kakavas. You want to make a motion? I said so moved. Oh, okay. Motion to adopt resolution R2018-01, approving the right-of-way fees and design. I have a motion, second by Council Member Alsop. Thank you. All those in favor? Any opposed? See that pass is 7 to 0. Next item we have is item 8C. Consideration of addition of a full-time building inspector, Mr. Justin Johnson. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. The city has experienced increases in the number of residential building permits received and processed over the last two years. 21% in 2016 from 52 permits to 66 and 29% in 2017 from 66 to 93. Um, actually, to update that number is now 99 for that time frame. There have also been significant increases in manufactured home inspections over the same period, with a 100% increase in 16 from 30, 13 to 26 inspections, and 45% increase in 2017 from 26 to 47. Additionally, construction has begun at Summit Healthcare Regional Medical Center for three new buildings with footings scheduled to be started in late January 2018. It is anticipated that this will result in a significant increase in time spent on inspections. The building de department has been without a dedicated full-time building inspector since 2009. The current inspection staff consists of a building official and the community development specialist, the latter of whom juggles his time between code enforcement issues 
and performing building inspections. Staff has been aware of the potential need for a full-time inspector, as was mentioned during the fiscal year 2018 budget discussions last spring. Because of the increased building activity and the need for inspections, staff is recommending that the council approve hiring one full-time building inspector. If the recruitment process is unsuccessful, staff may seek to enter into an agreement with a contract inspector who will perform the necessary duties. And staff is available for questions. Thank you. Any comments? Council Member Alsop. Thank you, Mayor. Justin, I got a question. Back in 2008 and nine, what were the numbers that uh, permits and stuff that was issued back in those days? Do you have that information at all? I don't have that one here with me, but we could probably ask. Yeah, yes. there he is. He's got the <laughs> answers. There's a smile on his face. <laughs> I have the big black book of building statistical data. So in 2008, um, total permits, we issued 447. That included 107 single family. And how many of those were mobile homes? Do you have that information too? Uh, manufactured homes and RVs were 23 of those permits. And that's for the whole year, correct? Entire year, correct, yeah. So the information you guys gave us here for the last two years, 2016, it came up 21%. So it went from 52 to 62, that's all. Just about 300 some odd less than what we did in 2008. Well, the number, the 52 to 62 is single family only. Okay. So in 2008, we did 107 single okay. family only. In 2009, single family, we dropped to 27. Yes, because, of, yeah, that's that's when everybody here was pretty much came on board on the council when we took that big old hit. When the right, government. right. So the numbers in the staff report are basically the last couple of years. Uh, we didn't go all the way back through from 2008 um, and, and trace every year, but uh, just for the councils, I can tell you in 2008, single family, we were at 107. 2009, we were at 27. 2010, we were at 22. 2011, we were at 27. So you're seeing that number for those three years stay fairly consistent. 2012 was where we took the biggest hit. We dropped down to 13 single family in 2012. And then we started to see the increase. In 13, we were at 35. In 14, we were at 55. In 15, we were at 52. So we kind of reached a little bit of a, a plateau there between 14 and 15. And then in 16, we went up to 66. And this year, our goal was 100. I promised my staff homemade green chili, and we got 99. So we, we may still work something out. So, okay, and my next question then, if, if we had that many in 2008, how many, how many inspectors did we have in 2008, do you remember? In 2008, uh, total staff in the Planning and Zoning Building Department was 12. Uh, that includes uh, permit techs, that includes building official, that includes, I think, three full-time uh, building inspectors as well then as the planning staff and code enforcement staff. And, in, and uh, if I remember right, and Ed could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in those bad years, we only had to get rid of, we didn't get rid of anybody. We furloughed people and moved things around and only one person left the city for, for not taking a job, but most of them were out of planning, planning and zoning. Is that correct? Right. It was a building inspector that took the um, reduction in force. Okay. Um, and I know um, we've known about uh, some in healthcare for probably about three or four years now that they were going to be purchased or they did purchase it and looked at doing the stuff like that. I am definitely, definitely in favor of trying to recruit and uh, contract the inspector out, especially if it's going to be just, if he's going to be working most of the time with just um, some in healthcare to, to inspect those buildings and everything else. And I mean, we could contract that out and, and put all that stuff in that expenditure over there uh, compared to us taking the expenditure. Because I think, and Justin can answer this question, is if I hire a person for 35000 for wages, 
the loaded labor rate on top of that takes me up to about about 175. This this 35 is for half a year. Half a year that includes everything. Okay, so Wages, so benefits. So then now my, now my numbers are definitely really changed. So if I go for a whole year with a loaded labor rate. Um, with retirement, the whole shebang, I'm looking at about what, 175? 70,000. Okay. So I think we could contract that, this stuff out and get the inspection done by at least by a contractor to find out if our numbers are still going to be growing or not instead of jumping and hiring and having that extra expense out of there if this thing flattens out again. I mean, we, we are dang lucky that we are starting to move up. I, 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 you know, we're grateful for that. Because for so many years we took a down slide in this, and I'm so I'm, I'm grateful that we're seeing an upslide. But instead of just hiring somebody because we got some numbers starting to creep up there, I much rather see us contract it out. Because for the last seven years I've been asking at budget uh, budget hearings and stuff like that to hire somebody for maintenance program because I think that we don't have enough people out there doing that type of work. And every year I get shot down. And then all we do, we hire contractors to take care, to fill in for those summer days. And, and we've done that for the last two or three years. And we also now have contractors coming to take care of City Hall and, and the library and stuff like that. I've been seeing it's magic around doing uh, maintenance and stuff like that. So we're already in a, in, a, in a kind of a scenario where we are hiring contractors to take care of some of our stuff that we're doing instead of having full-time employees. So that's why I'm thinking, it's a lot better. I, it's a lot easier for me to swallow by doing a contractor than it is to hire a full-time employee, just because I don't want to see us have to get rid of a full-time employee later on. So, thank you for your time on that. Yeah, and and understood, uh, which is why the staff report under the uh, recommendation would be either or. Yeah. Um, certainly, we understand there are financial constraints, and we need to go with what is most appropriate for the city, um, having had to sit across the table from a number of those employees and tell them, we no longer have a position for you in the building department, I would prefer to avoid that as much as possible. Can you, so. can you answer one more question for me? Um, from groundbreaking to finished product, how long do you think Summit Healthcare is going to need an inspector? Six months, eight months, a year, year and a half? The construction schedule that we were provided uh, indicated that they were going to start construction this month. So you'll actually see concrete in the ground in January. Uh, the construction of the shell buildings is anticipated to last a little over a year, uh, approximately 14 months or so. Uh, then we have about 200,000 square feet worth of tenant improvements that need to take place. So uh, it's anticipated that this is going to be probably at least two or three years that we're going to see that particular impact. Thank you. Let, let me add one comment. We are exploring all the options. We have our building official contacting um, inspection firms to get contract prices right now. But we want to have our leave our options open. So we, the reason this is on the agenda, we need to advertise for a building inspector because it takes weeks to be able to hire one, and we want to see what those options are. If we can get an inspector for half the price of what a contract person would be for the duration of this project, we may it may be beneficial for the city to go to the inspector and do some more code enforcement out there. You know, I, I look back at it, you know, if, if that's what we're going to, we should, probably should have done a long time ago because I think the cold enforcement has been put on the back burner. I, I haven't seen a lot of it as, as we, we a lot agree of it's going you. on, you know. So I, I understand where you're coming from um, if you're going to do dual projects with them or anything else. But, I, you know, I think if we're going to hire a full-time inspector, then that's what they need to do if these numbers or what they're saying that they is, and I'm not saying that they're not telling me the truth, because I, I remember the words of uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify, so I want to definitely verify, because I'm trusting you that with it, the numbers you're giving me. But if, if the numbers are going up, then yeah, we need to have some some uh, some inspectors out there. Doing dual purpose, I, you know, I think the contract inspector, sh we should have one for just, just doing some in healthcare, if they're, if they might be need to be there 40 hours a week. I'm not sure. I don't know how much inspection it's going to need. 
that could but, happen some of the weeks. The, the problem is getting a contract inspector to Sholo, Arizona, and the cost of that. Yeah. That's what we're weighing the options for here. You know, I, yeah, you know, I, I like to see what the price is for that compared to what my load of labor rate is here for, for the people of Sholo. That's what we're doing. And I don't know the level, the level inspector of what it may take to inspect some that may be at a higher level than where we could maybe use somebody who has that training already in our department to do that, mm -hmm. where we could hire a lower level entry person to do maybe some of the other inspections. Right, I, I, I agree with you. That out too. Council Member Kelly. The way this motion is worded, does it give staff the option to continue to play both ends against the middle? and get a good estimate or good number on contract inspections. And I mean, I think, I it think does. It, I mean, uh, go ahead. I think it does because it authorizes us to hire a full-time, uh, add a full-time building inspector, but just like any other uh, position in the city, if we can't find that position, we can contract and we'll do the budget adjustments as it says um, in the motion to, to, to execute the budget transfers. If we can't find a, if, if a contract position is what we want, we'll execute the budget transfers for that position. But we, if the council passes this, we intend to advertise for a building inspector and see what kind of applications we could get. That's Mayor Kelly. Yeah, and our standard policy of a new hire is you're on probation for how long? Uh, probation period is 12 months. 12 months, but it isn't understood, or is it understood, that that's kind of conditioned upon if the workload's still there. I mean, we're not gonna have somebody move a significant distance to show <coughs> to take this job on the, maybe it'll be here next year and maybe it won't, but that's always what you're up against, whether you, whether you admit it or not, right? Uh, I think all of us face that, whatever position we're in, whether it's in the city or uh, other jobs. It's true, but in fact, we all know government jobs <laughs> have far less of that built in than, you know, the contractor job that you go answer the ad to and you become a backhoe operator today and he finishes the contract he's on and eat, out you go, you know? But I, I Hear what Mike's saying. I would like you to really look hard at what it would cost us for at least a maybe a six month period or something to do the contract on it. And boy, I think I see and I think we know from all of the books that are written on inspections that we don't necessarily want one person assigned to a major job. That's got some real holes in it. Real temptations built in, if you will. I'll be bold enough to say it that way. If no one, no other inspector's ever on the job, that that's just not good business, I don't think. Anyhow, I'm going to vote for this based on the increase and in the activity in that department and the workload, and try to get ahead of it just a little bit and and be ready for it. But why well, I want you to really see if a, a contract position could be had, uh, maybe even from somebody that has recently retired from this kind of thing and mm -hmm. would be willing to contract for six months. Then let's, if they give us a good three month lead that they're taking off, we could do a pretty good job of getting ready for it maybe. I don't know, I, I, I lean hard toward what Mike's saying, I don't want to lean hard enough to, I don't see myself voting against this motion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yes, uh, Mr. Sislagi, I think I remember a conversation that you and I had that circled around the availability and the uh, effect of having good building inspectors and building inspectors available. Uh, and uh, I, appreciate the need for an inspector or a group of inspectors that can move around through the projects. Now we do have the summit coming along. I'm talking about one project that I was involved with, with the hotel. And that was a time killer when we couldn't get an, in, uh, an inspection. 
and be able to uh, remedy the problems and have it reinspected and get on with it. Uh, so I'm very much in favor. I know that you folks will manage the need, but I'm not going to get in the way of you getting the inspectors that you need to support the activities going on in this community. And I'm optimistic enough looking ahead that I think we're going to see growth in the community and we won't run out and hire a bunch of inspectors, but I certainly see the need to have an inspector and the number of inspectors that you would anticipate that you would need to carry through and not lose them at the end of, of contracts. Uh, so I'm going to support your need to add a permanent inspector. I think what's important here is kind of interesting too, as I've talked with the different people on this, you know, we have 100 billing permits, but that doesn't mean it's 100 inspections. And in a lot of cases, a home is anywhere from eight to 14 inspections for that one home. So that can be 1,400 inspections for just housing. So, but right now your staff is what, four? Currently our staff, we have a full-time building official who does plan review. Uh, he also meets with uh, private individuals, uh, individuals looking to build uh, and does inspections. Uh, we have a community development specialist who does code enforcement and building inspections. Uh, those are the only two who are certified to do actual building inspections for our department. When your department was 12, though, it's now four, four though, right? Four and a half. Uh, four we half. have an administrative assistant that we share with the engineer. We're doing department. good. We add five and get another 100 homes next year <laughs> to 200, and, and you'll be back here again, right? Uh, if the need presents itself, we would be, yes. <laughs> That's good. Let, let me have one more comment. This isn't a bad problem. This shows there's growth in Cholo. Um, we, just as an example, in the budget this year, we put $150,000 as revenue for building permits. Through five and a half months, we've collected over 230000 So we will exceed the revenue number by a large amount. Um, this fiscal year because of the building permits that have been issued. Councilwoman Kakavis. Of your two building inspectors, are both of them certified in commercial construction? Industry uh, our building construction? official is certified in commercial. A community development specialist is certified in residential. Okay. So kind of my concern here is I don't know as we're going to find somebody at that's going to have the skills for the industrial commercial level for the 35,000. So are we anticipating that we're going to move those inspections around somewhat and based on the skill level that we get in our advertisement? But if we go to a contract situation, would we seek a commercial inspector versus a residential? Uh, our intent, again, the 35000 that's mentioned uh, here, that's to finish out the fiscal year. So that's not $35,000 a year. Um, we then would have to make sure we budget in next uh, budget for the full uh, annual salary of that individual. Um, it could be challenging. There are a number of municipalities and jurisdictions that are also looking for building inspectors at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing this isn't... Uh, a problem universal to show up. we're seeing growth across the state. So we are in competition with uh, other jurisdictions. We think we've got some pretty good assets to show off when people come and uh, to Sholo. Uh, we wish we were hiring in the summer rather than in the winter, but winter hasn't been too bad so far. Um, to answer the question, uh, it would be anticipated that the person that we hire would be the primary person responsible for the hospital. Um, that would leave our building official time to do his primary responsibilities of plan review and meeting with members of the public and things like that. Not to say that he wouldn't fill in, uh, not to say that he wouldn't go and supervise from time to time to make sure that, you know, things were being addressed the way that they needed to be addressed. Uh, but primarily this individual uh, we would be looking at as a uh, hospital. Uh, if there were times that they were not full, um, you know, the hospital, maybe whatever reason they didn't need a, a full slate of inspections that day, uh, we would schedule them for some of the other inspections also. That way we could keep their time full. That would help keep 
um, particularly our code enforcement, um, get them back out doing what it is that they're supposed to be doing and, and really what we want them to do. Um, you know, going through our neighborhoods, being proactive, uh, meeting with property owners and not just waiting for a phone call to ring and then having to put it off because a contractor's got concrete coming that day. Um, this would allow us to, to help address that. Uh, one last question. Um, when, when we set this salary rate, what is the latest salary information that we used? Um, the HR department uh, got the league report. So they were looking at summaries and that's ranked by population. So we're in the 10 to 50,000 range. So there's about 15 to 20 cities on the survey that provided data. Then we come up with an average, go from there. Any other questions? Look for a motion. That's woman Kukavis. I move to approve adding one full-time building inspector and authorize the city manager to execute any budget transfers as needed to complete the process. I have a motion, second by Vice Mayor. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? See that pass five to one. Thank you. Next item we have, I'm not sure. We have a summary of current events. I look to council members at this time for any current events. That's member also. Thank you, Mayor. I'm hoping everybody had a great Christmas and Happy New Year. I uh, happened to uh, be able to go to the drop the Deuce of Clubs uh, New Year's Eve down here in downtown Sholo. Uh, had a number of people there. Uh, if you looked at the online from uh, Birdman, there was probably 150 or so people there, maybe more. But uh, everybody's having a good time. The, what I liked about it was talking to people, a lot of them, this was their first time ever being to Sholo or even being to this event. Uh, but they they uh, like the scene a little bit more. And I, I asked them why, and they said we'd like a band or something to play to keep something instead of just standing around smoking campfire to stay warm. And I said, well, it's been colder, so you're, you lucked out this time. But, uh, you know, I, and so there's just something that I like to put out there to see if we can look at something, uh, uh, maybe having our, our, our bus or our van there, that our stage, and uh, maybe put up some bands and everything else. I know there's going to be some winters where it's going to be cold and wet, and, and there's going to be some that's going to be dry like it was this one. But uh, uh, let's look at trying to uh, make this uh, event a little bit bigger every year. It's pretty been pretty much the same for the last seven years, so let's see if we can uh, beef that up a little bit if we can. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other council report? Let's share a report. Uh, many of you may know, along with the town of Pine Top Lakeside, the city is sponsoring a Pray for Snow campaign. We invite all residents and businesses to join us in praying for snow because of the warm, dry weather is negatively impacting our local businesses and economy. And without snow conditions, uh, they will worsen during the spring and the summer months. We also urge all property owners to deep water your trees and plants once a month until we receive some snow or precipitation. It's interesting just how dry it is and these plants and trees need some moisture. This year's Martin Luther King Jr. holiday is Monday, January 15th. It is a day normally reserved for the city of Sholo here that we've used it as a day of service to improve the community. As we've done in the past several years, Sholo's day of service in honor of Martin Luther King has moved to May. And we encourage our citizens to volunteer their time and participate in a city employees in a service project on Saturday, May 12th, to strengthen and enhance our community. Appreciate it. And just uh, want to wish everybody a happy new year. Appreciate uh, having 2018 here. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just a reminder for everybody, you can still recycle Christmas trees by dropping them off by Nick <laughs> by this Sunday, January 7th at the designated area at Frontier Park parking lot north of the Deuce of Clubs on 9th Place and you need to remove all the decorations and tinsel and lights. We're beginning to, the process of to prepare the SISI's fiscal year 2019 budget in addition to budget study sessions with the council on Tuesday, January 16th at 6 p.m. This is a reminder for the council. 
6 p.m. January 16th, a town hall budget meeting specifically designed for citizens will be held January 18th, that's on Thursday at 6 p.m. here in the council chambers. All of our budget meetings are held in the council chambers and for a list of all the budget meetings, you can refer to our website and find all the ones that are scheduled at this time. And finally, following the busy holiday season, and as was mentioned by Councilman Ossop, the Deuce of Clubs drop on Sunday night. The Recreation Department is already preparing for 2018 events. Tickets are on sale for $6 each for the popular Daddy-Daughter Dance, and that'll be held for February 2nd at the City Campus Gym. And they're also accepting registrations for the sixth annual Barbecue Throwdown scheduled for Saturday, May 5th. And there's a number of other events. You can check our website, choloaz.gov, um, to um, scope out those events, see which ones you'd be interested in. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I just want to, you know, kudos to Chief back here in the back room for what they did. You know, I guess he's got a pretty good reading on, uh, you know, things through Christmas time, but that was something that was well attended. I think we had over 450 uh, young kids out for some readings that happened over Christmas and there was quite a few letters that were expressed from people outside our community that experienced that and it was a well attended event and so thanks for your efforts there chief and what you participated in that any other comments or anything going forward okay tonight we have an executive session uh, where we will talk about lease or real sale or purchase of real property uh, I'll say P number two zero 210-49-120 and then also executive minutes of December 5th. Need a motion to move into executive session. We have a motion by count, uh, Vice Mayor to move into executive sessions, seconded by Council Member Kelly. All those in favor? Any opposed? See that passed six to zero. Thank you.